men ought always to pray and faint not. So if you're a man, you ought to pray. And that man, the term man over there is generic, which includes women. So if you're a human being, you have to pray. Because prayer is a system, is a system it, which is established by God to have that communion, connection, and life of God to flow through you. We've been talking about the blood for some time, and I did share a little bit. Uh, we carried on with that subject on um, Good Friday. Um, and I want us to look at something as we get ready to partake of the communion. Okay, just a minute. When you don't understand truth and receive the truth, with revelation, you will not be able to apply and experience the power that is locked into that word. Every word of God is full of power. God's word is God's power. It comes locked in. What unlocks it is the revelation. So somebody can be coming all their life to church and never experience the touch of God. But someone else can just walk in and experience a tremendous release in, in different areas of their lives. Both of them have been under the same influence of the same word. But one person received revelation, which means their spiritual eyes have been opened to capture so that the power in that word is unlocked and you begin to experience it. This is why I say I don't want to make you religious, but I want, you to, make, I want to make you spiritual. We have to become beings who will become more and more aware that you are spirit beings. And God is not impressed through religious activity. Some religious activities are good because they bring in and breed discipline to make our spirits, spirit more active. But the end of the game or the end result is not becoming religious to impress God that I do this and I do that and I go there and I do, you know, like I fast for so many days, I pray for so many days or so, you know, whatever it is. All that is good. All those are very important exercises to attain something, which is what? Your spirit man to become active, to pick up the impulses and the signals of God. This is something very important. Because people try to impress God by their actions. Actions should be the fruit of what you have received. You see, you don't impress God with good works. But when you're born again, the fruit is good works. You see what I'm saying? So you don't earn anything from God through your good works. But because you received God, you cannot but produce good works. How many understood what I said? Amen. So I want you to understand God wants us to become very, very spiritual. That means our spirit man has to be active and we should never forget this. That God wants to do life with you. It's not just praying in the, in, you know, for an hour in the morning and then saying, see you tonight, Lord. Nor just praying or going to church on Sunday and saying, we'll see you next Friday or next Sunday. See, many people that are even genuine live compartmentalized lives. This is a time for God. This is for time for my business, or this is my time in the school, or the college, or university, or whatever, or in the, or in the, you know, in, in the hospital where I'm working, and we try to compartmentalize. No, God wants to do life with you. That means on the floor where you're working, He wants to be involved. He wants to be involved in my business. He wants to be involved in my family. He wants to be involved where he is supreme. He is king. He is Lord. I, I, I acknowledge his lordship in every area, every aspect of my life, and every hour of my life. 
That means I'm constantly living with the awareness of his presence. I'm building something in my spirit, man, where I'm aware God is with me. See, but to get to that place, I need those times where I am setting aside to spend time with God. Look at Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. But Jesus is human as well, right? 100% man, 100% God. Because he is man, what does he say? Men ought always to pray and faint not. So if you're a man, you ought to pray. And that man, the term man over there is generic, which includes women. So if you're a human being, you have to pray. Because prayer is a system. Is a system in, which is established by God to have that communion, connection, and life of God to flow through you. Listen to me carefully. Proximity is not the answer. Do you realize that Jesus, where is Jesus now? I know he's in your heart, but where else is he? On the right hand side of God. There is no other position that is closer to the heart of God than where Jesus is seated. And yet, what is Jesus doing? Tell me. Why? Because he's still man. Men ought always to pray and faint not. So what I'm talking about is not prayer. We're asking for God to meet your needs alone. Your praying is a system by which you remain in constant communion with God. You are, you are working on your spirit man to become more and more aware of him and developing a more intimate relationship with him. Say amen. Are you getting what I'm saying? So I want you to understand, whatever we teach here is not to just give you some intellectual knowledge. I pray that my words that proceed out of my mouth will be anointed of God that will birth revelation. And that that word that you receive, you will be able to put into practice. You will be able to act on it and experience what God has promised. When we're talking about the blood this morning, I don't want you to get just intellectual understanding about the blood and be able to talk about the blood, but experience the power in the blood. What is the power in the blood of Jesus? Because there is tremendous power in the blood of Jesus. What most people don't understand is the, the, the most powerful truth Of Jesus bringing us into the consciousness of righteousness. It's an extremely powerful truth. The reason most prayers are not answered, one of the major reasons is, we always approach God with a sin consciousness. What, is that, what does that mean in a nutshell? It means that you are convinced that you're not good enough. You're not worthy. You haven't prayed enough. You haven't gone to church enough. You haven't read the Bible enough. You have done so and so, so harm to somebody. You talked about this. You did that. You're constantly bombarded with your shortfalls. And what that does is it creates a consciousness in us, in us where we go to God in prayer, but we go with this mindset and attitude. I hope God will answer me. You won't verbalize it, but that's the feeling with which you go. Because you disqualify yourself saying, I'm not good enough. Why would God want to answer me? Look at the guy that came down the mountain. I'm sorry. When Jesus came down the mountain, a leper approached him. He said, Lord, I, you know, you can heal me. But I'm not sure if you want to heal me. Because he felt like, I'm not good enough. I don't think I'm qualified to receive your love. 
I'm not qualified to claim what you possess. I'm not good enough. Who am I? What, why should I deserve this? So, if we don't deal with that area, you can be a Christian all your life and not experience the genuine love and intimacy with God and experience the power and the ma manifestation of His glory in your life. So it's extremely important for us to understand the power in that blood. Remember, the Bible tells us that we are wrestling against, not against flesh and blood. Give me Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, please. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, look at this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hey, I don't know if you're aware, but you're in a, ma in a wrestling match right now. The fight is in your mind. In different areas. And what the devil will focus on is always working constantly to do a couple of things. Number one, to disconnect you with God, from God. That means what? Not that you will sin. You become unaware of his presence. You don't live in the consciousness and the awareness of his presence with you. And as a result, what happens, if that is constant, what happens? Watch this. What happens is you begin to lose the desire for him. Will I go to hell if I don't go to church? Not at all. But the fire will die. And your conscience will be seared that after six months of not going to church, now you'll come up with a theory and a teaching as to why you don't have to go to church. Because now what you're trying to do is you're trying to please your conscience. Ease yourself. Come on, talk to me somebody. You don't read the Bible for six months. Nothing happens. Now you tell people, you don't have to read the Bible every day. It's okay. Look at my life. Well, what you don't understand, you're drying up on the inside. It's like as I said the other day, you take a piece of log in a bonfire. It's red hot. It's burning. The flames, you can see the flame. You take it aside and put it on the side. You still see the embers on fire. You can see them red hot. But how long? Soon they're going to die. It's going to die out. It's going to turn into coal. But if you bring it back and put it in the fire, it's going to burn again. When you can be disconnected, dislocated from his presence, you won't see the results or experience the results immediately. This is the problem. When somebody sins, they wait for God to punish them. When it doesn't seem like God has punished them, they, they say, okay, I can, you know, that's like a, a line on this in the sand. I can, okay, well, I don't, everything is nice. Let me take it forward. This is how children work with their parents. They push the line. Nothing happens. They push the line further. Nothing happens. Until one day they realize they're moving forward without God. And your conscience is seared. Now you don't experience the love that you used to. You begin to dry up on the inside and you begin to wonder what's going on. Why am I not experiencing the Lord as I used to? Thank God for what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, let me tell you that applies to the body of Christ. I don't care what teaching you heard before, that scripture applies to the body of Christ. If we confess our sins, is faithful and just to forgive us of, all, of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness means what? Not having the ability to stand in his presence guilt-free. So when I come into the presence of God, I need to know, I need to come with this knowing and this confidence that God hears me. What does it say in 1 John chapter 5, verse 15, I think? Give me that, please, or 16. <sighs> Give 
Go back a verse. Watch this. And this is the confidence that we have in him. Wait. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Wait a minute. He's talking about approaching God with what? Everybody. This is an important element and key in your prayer life. If you don't have confidence, work on that before you ask him for anything else. Because what, what, what shakes your confidence or causes you to waver is the lack of confidence. And the lack of confidence can be because of negligence. It can not, it's not necessarily sin, but the sin of negligence. Neglecting to do what you know is right. Neglecting to do what you know will help you to become more intimate. It's one thing to know how to build stamina. It's another thing to actually build stamina. I can give you a lecture on how to build stamina. Don't ask me if I'm doing it. See, this is how most Christians live. Am I right? So he says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we, have, if we ask him anything according to his will, he hears us. Go to the next one. And if we know that he hears us, we should know that he has heard us. And this confidence comes through the knowledge of you being righteous in his sight. Now we're going to deal with that. But I'm still in my introduction. So we're saying, we are wrestling with principalities, powers, and forces of darkness. Watch this. These are all spiritual powers. These are not natural. So if you want to beat the spiritual powers, you need spiritual weaponry. You cannot, let me tell you, your intellect your education is no match to what the powers of the devil are. You cannot overcome the devil through intellect. You cannot cast a devil out through psychology or psychiatry. No. These are spiritual attacks. And we need to be trained in the, using, in the usage of spiritual weaponry. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, it says this. For the weapons, everybody say weapons. Yes. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal, which is what in the natural world, right? According to the flesh. But mighty through God to the pulling down of the stronghold. The weapons that God has given us are what? Say it, mighty. mighty. Say it louder. Mighty. mighty weapons have been given to us. To battle and to win over the forces of darkness. Please understand. So, among many weapons, let me give you three at least. The name of Jesus. The blood. The word. These are all weapons. There are several other weapons. The knowledge of being righteous in his presence. It's a weapon. This understanding is lacking in the body of Christ to a large degree. See, this is what I want you to understand. Thank God, God is a healing God. God is a God of miracles. But if you only come to church for miracles, then you're missing what God really intended for you. Let me say it this way. <clears throat> the end result of my ministration should not just be miracles, but transformation and renewal. If lives are not being transformed and there are only healings happening, then I'm not fulfilling my purpose. Jesus was not just satisfied with doing miracles. 
he would sit and teach. Why? He was transforming their thinking. He was transforming their lives, renewing, and say, this is how you live in the kingdom. Are you with me? He said, in the kingdom, don't judge if you don't want to be judged. In the kingdom, if you want all your needs to be met, he said, give, and it shall be given unto you. He was teaching them principles to affect their mindset. Because they were raised in a different mindset. They were raised in a Jewish culture. And he was mostly talking to the Jews in his lifetime. And he would say, they would come and say, teach us to pray. And say, our father. Father? What do you mean father? It's so foreign to the mind of a Jew to call God a father. Because listen, until that time they were not even... Supposed to mention his name, speak his name. I had a Jewish rabbi who said, I don't believe in God. Because the word God does not appear in the original text. The word that appears is Hashem. Hashem is not God. Isn't that interesting? English has brought that word. So everybody, God becomes a generic term. Every religion has God. But the Jewish religion does not have God. It has Hashem. Hashem loved Moses. Hashem spoke to Moses. Hashem in a form is love. Lo now interpret that. Love spoke to Moses. Not God. Love spoke. Love did these things for the children of God. Children of Israel. You're following what I'm saying? So we need to have a true understanding of how to live this life spiritually with the understanding of God's word. Lives have to be transformed. Not just physical healing. Not just financial progress or financial abundance. Not just elevation in life here. You remember, I don't care how healthy you are, the span of the, span of the life of man is 120, God said. Thank God for 120, but after that, you're leaving this place. And you're going to go to a place where there is no count for time. So you better think about that more than what about thinking about just here. All right, so we're talking about the weapon. Let's get back to this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And we're talking about these weapons, the name of Jesus, the blood, and the word. Now, but we want to focus our attention to the blood, okay? Now, the blood... Of Jesus. Listen to this. There are several things it does, but we're going to focus on something very particular this morning. Number one, it, um, it cleanses us, which we all know. The blood is for our protection. The blood is for our peace with God. The blood is for reconciliation with God. The blood is a weapon for deliverance as well. There are several aspects. We can't cover all that, but let me take you uh, on a journey this morning. Now, um, Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. Jesus came and with his precious blood made the payment so you and I can be saved. Okay? So you and I can be restored back to God. Romans chapter 3 verse 24 to 26, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, says, God in his grace freely, everybody say freely, freely, makes us right in his sight. Stop. We have been made right with God in his sight. We did not do it. We've been conferred. So the term that is used is called righteousness. The ability to stand before God without the sense of inferiority or guilt. That's called righteousness. That means I can step into his presence with boldness. And there's a scripture we'll look at. But we're doing this because and through the blood of Jesus. So when I go into his presence, now watch this. And be, take note of this please. When I come into God's presence, if I don't sense any guilt, don't keep asking, Lord, is there anything that I've done? Is there anything that I've done? Is there anything to, that I've done? No. 
Because if there is something, the Holy Spirit will throw light on it. And he doesn't expose everything at the same time. Okay. Just be sensitive. And if you sense guilt in your heart about anything, you sense that this is what is like a wall between me and my God, then deal with it right away. But the next thing is, now that should breed confidence in you that through the blood, I have now access to his presence and to his attention. God is giving me audience through the blood. Remember, in the old covenant, when somebody stepped into the Holy of Holies, in a way that was not prescribed by God, their dead body was pulled out. But today, because of the blood, look at the mercy of God. God opened up the way by tearing the veil, which the Bible calls the flesh of, the, of Jesus, and opened up a way for us to enter into the Holy of Holies with confidence that we will not be killed. Number two, we will be heard. Amen. Hallelujah. So your prayer life will be transformed if you begin to understand this. That's why you, this understanding of the blood is so important. I come with the knowledge and understanding of the power there is invested in the blood of Jesus that now gives me access into the presence of God and also gives me the confidence that God will answer my cries. Somebody say amen.